Good afternoon. Thank you, Erica, for the invitation and interest in hearing me. Uh, congratulations for the organization of such a lovely event. Thanks to all of you for your presence. I'm not sure whether this is going to be a keynote or an artist talk. Either way it goes, I present myself here with and without hesitation, with or without fear of reflecting with you about my poems, which I often call creative investigations. The poet, author, and intellectual from the beautiful Azores Islands, Vitorino Nemesio, once narrated in his radiant irony that when he entered the Faculty of Letters at the University of Lisbon to teach, his colleagues would whisper, here comes the poet. <laughs> and when at night he arrived at the cafe, his poet friends commented, the teacher has arrived. <laughs> Another Portuguese writer, Miguel Torga, rightly wrote that no tree explains its fruits, but it enjoys that one eats them. You, so being introduced by Erika as a professor and a poet uh, helps me keep a certain distance from both categories. You have all read Annie Abrams' words, being in between is not what we need, not what we are. So let me concentrate on that last line, last line alone. L'entre deux equals void. Can we be with instead of in between? To be with code instead of in between codes actually inspired the two works that I have created and programmed for you today. Poems are problems as Antonio Aragão formulated in his beautiful expression, Problems. The same being articulated in this visual poem by Anatol Kolek on the right. They are also a quest, a problematization of language. The word, however, is logos, reason, manifestation of being. And writing is always performed under constraint. Parole comes out of lang, system enables process. This structuralist way of viewing language implies that somehow discourses are produced in between, in between signifier and signified, in between form and content, in between code and message, in between lang and parole, and I promise you that I have created this slide days ago. <laughs> can we ever abandon such dichotomies? More, can we resist language, the power of language? I believe that we need to resist within language itself by creating non-places, deluding language. What Holland Barth has called a salutary cheating, a magnificent lure. That is the power of poetry displacement, permanent change of place, no fixed topos. However, when we say that poetry and writing in general in digital media is ephemeral, performative, in tune with the new media paradigm, or perhaps we could call it the new media myth, which is to interact, to participate, to personalize, is there any room to criticize such paradigm? I say estrangement, not entrenchment. And that is to say, with, not in between. Allow me a short parenthesis to tell you that when Coca-Cola decided to launch in Portugal, they asked the company who had exclusive rights to import products from the USA to create a slogan. And the modernist to be poet, Fernando Pessoa, who worked in that firm as a translator at the time, was the one writing it. <laughs> Primeiro estranha-se, depois entranha-se, which translates to something like, first it amazes you, then it gets into your veins. Uh -huh. Or literally, first estrangement, 
than entrenchment. As a result, Coca-Cola was prohibited by the Portuguese government <laughs> for, alleged, for allegedly being a product susceptible of creating habituation. <laughs> With these rather long introductory remarks, what I mean to put forward is that code implies dialogues and involves different forms of translation processes, hence the title of my communication, Translating Code, Coding Translation. Now, code also produces creative problems, problems that ask for creative solutions, and that is why I believe that we must address it with estrangement and not entrenchment. I have covered this dilemma in my recent essay published at the Electronic Book Review called Humor and Constraint in Electronic Literature, following some reflections in my keynote at DLO conference in Montreal using Peter Sloterdijk's differentiation between kinicism and cynicism. For Sloterdijk, kinicism is a rejection of official cultures by means of irony and sarcasm confronting the normalized ideologies masked by cynicism. Cynicism thus represents enlightened false consciousness, ignoring the constructed nature of reality. I am now working with Bernard Stiegler's opposition between adaption and adoption, and again, I promise you that this presentation was done a few days ago, quite a coincidence for my presentation in TLO in Cork with Eugenio Kiseli. According to Stiegler, if one blindly follows the dictates of the techno-capitalist regime, one is forced to adapt to an endless stream of digital novelties that are often released exclusively under the rationale of the market. On the contrary, when one adopts such novelties, one makes them their own and creates bifurcations that deviate from the hegemony. What I want to do here with you is to present and discuss two works that I have recently programmed, which I believe are clinical rather than cynical, adopting instead of adapting to technology, in reply to Erika Fulop's uh, statement in the call for papers of this conference, of which I'm just going to stress the first line. How can we be with languages in their plurality rather than just in between them and lost in translation? Okay, these two works are Perdido, Perdido dans la traduzione, lost in translation, and Fake Phone for a Droid. My intention was to, one, creatively appropriate text-to-speech tools, two, adapt to technologi technological apparatuses, Three, resist digital writing constraints. Situated in the field of electronic literature, more specifically, generally generative aesthetics and combinatory structures, my quest can, not with, notwithstanding, be framed by writers <coughs> and poets from other ages. So two quotes that serve as illuminating ideograms for my talk. Austrian writer, journalist, playwright, and poet Karl Kraus wrote, logic is the enemy of art, but art is not the enemy of logic. Mm -hmm. To say that one, two plus two are five, one must know that two plus two are four. And the Portuguese poet Herbert Welder writes in one of, one of his beautiful poems, I try to say how everything is something else. Let's roll back, or perhaps forward, to electronic literature. Some 10 years ago, I have programmed with Nuno Ferreira a library of functions, a JavaScript lib called Poemario, that allows me and everyone interested, because it's open source, to encode complex combinatory texts with variable sound textures in XML using permutational techniques to promote infinite possible variations. I have used this writing tool in diverse experiments, and the two works that I bring with, with me today were also at least partially programmed using this lib. Um, in order to understand these works, you should be aware that I'm very much interested in humor and parody, 
and some of my previous works appropriate and perform creative deformations and transformations of advertisements, propaganda discourses, both in content, such as slogans and sound bites, as in form, adapting interfaces and design. More recently, I have started exploring mixed media formats, creating hybrid objects that I have named fake scripts, code snippets from several programming languages, appropriated and adapted for the inclusion of poetry. In both cases, real scripts or <coughs> fake scripts, I believe that electronic literature can play a critical role in literary practices, engaging readers with the materiality of media and thus motivating awareness about our current media ecology, turning transparent interfaces into opaque and visible objects, translating networked information, working with the machine, thus substantiating forms of resistance to dominant discourses. Let me start with the first example, Perdido dans la traduzione, exploring poetic intratextual combinatory permutations across four Romance languages, Portuguese, French, Spanish, Italian. It all starts with a verse of poetry, o mundo hostil e percível dói. The hostile and perishable world hurts. All words in this sentence were programmed with lex lexical, uh, multiple lexical variations. I then translated this verse to French, le monde hostil et perissable fait mal, Spanish, el mundo hostil et perecedero duele, and Italian, <coughs> le mondo hostile de perivele fa male, as well as all the words in the database. To make it clear in a simple way, let's look at the most elementary categories involving the pronoun, the, translated as ou, le, el, il, and the coordinating conjunction and, translated as i, e, i. The lists associated with the nouns and adjectives are way more complex. And the fact that I mix all four languages in the same category allows for Babel, literally, to be enacted. Let's check it out first without sound. So this is being generated based on combinatory procedures. And as you can see, infinite variations based on the first utterance are mixing for different languages. Then a second process How on then a second process a new translation. And the first 26 random resulting variations from each language were inserted into a text-to-speech online tool and read by different national voices with multiple speakers in a total of 104 sound files. That's fine. No, These voices were further mixed with other sound textures performed by Luis Ali in an organismic synthesizer, and I have created approximately uh, 27 sound textures with 40 seconds each. You are cansado and vibrant soul. You are cansado and vibrant soul. Elvento fascinante e psilon percival estrangulou. El adulto serendo rimchu. Eu sangue dormi e secreto de hoje. Ele me segurou é tu So, confusion, discomfort, polyphony, complexity. And readers can also access individual program variations for each language alone using this menu here. Psalm 
ou um sereno vacilo? O sua emoção expressou a tribuna serena. French. The débile le mystérieux rêve Schuder. Le filo rosa de Serena suspira. Et lui, sa fascinante et mystérieuse batilla. Le filo rosa de Serena suspira. With a bonus. Here you can see that two English variations, Lost in Translation A and B, are also available. Lost in Translation A, the voice reads all Romance languages, but no English. The sound way unsafe, why will you manure research? Why will Lost in Translation B, there's something wrong, some problem here. Lost in Translation B, the text-to-speech voice reads its own code. Exclamation mark dot type HTML. HTML. Head. Meta charset equals UTF-8. Ghost voice, Meta name perhaps. equals viewboard content equals width equals device width. Initial scale equals 1.0. Meta name equals description content equals easily... A parody, critically addressing linguistic discourses from within, based on the aesthetics of frustration, named by Philip Boots, that investigates the creative tensions of elite, now contaminated by E. Babel. I consider this experiment as digital language art, investigating linguistic processes and constraints promoting a, a transgression of writing using generative operations to subvert our current technical apparatuses, namely databases, algorithms, text-to-speech tools. Our tour, as John Cayley proposes, could perhaps help us resist myth, constituting a regressive semiological system. And Philip Booth's aesthetics of frustration, that is, to read the reading, which implies a double reading, may support my argument deception, frustration, failure. Whatever writers try to avoid, these reflexive poems try to put into practice. More, electronic literature is defined by Serge Bouchardon as the result of various creative tensions. Tensions between media types and platforms, between distinct semiotic forms, between computer programming and writing. These texts try to place the reader in a situation of loss, unsettling, making foundations falter, turning our relationship with language into crisis. Poems, problems. John Cage in his diary, Audience, 1966. Are we an audience for computer art? The answer is not no. Yes. What we need is a computer that isn't labor-saving, but which increases the work for us to do. That which Friedrich Bloch refers to as poetic techne, poetics that self-referentially works as technology, poetry that relates to the means and procedures of our culture of technology, forcing us to make sense between restriction and freedom. Poetry, language art, that raises the linguisticality of the techno technological culture as well as existing and new language techniques and acts this out condenses and recontextualizes them. In short, contaminates them poetically. In her study, Algorithmic Translations, Rita Rayleigh claims that automatic translation tools reinforce the techno-linguistic consensus, the mandate that everything, every inscription, every speech act can be made accessible all the time, on demand, wherever we are resembling, of course, Michel Foucault's modernist compulsion of the archive to accumulate everything. Rayleigh proposes that because translation is a mediated, technically organized activity, 
media artists working on site within the actual terrain of translation practice, computational environments, are at the moment best positioned to explore this aspect of translational practice. Translating code, coding translation. Now, for my second work, Fake Phone for a Droid, developing on my previous fake scripts, which are code snippets with poetry, I have made an attempt at transforming a transparent appliance, a mobile phone, into an illegible <coughs> device, a fake phone. So this is going to be a hybrid mixed media object made of three components. A handmade object, yes, handmade by me, with the size and form of a smartphone at the center of the picture, and here, for you later to explore, with cards that transcode 10 Java functions for the Android operating system, incorporating poetry in their strings. Two, a web app using the images of the fake phone coded cards on the right side of this picture, with the Java functions read by text-to-speech US English Joanna. Three, and finally, a typographical composition with four small detachable cards on the left side in this picture with excerpts of the above mentioned codes. Before I present this procedural work, processual work with more detail, allow me to provide some context. In March 2016, responding to an invitation from the group Unstable Media, which acts through variable media and media which are subject to disappearance, I prepared uh, for the exhibition Faz Tu Mesma, Do It Yourself, Art by Instruction, my first fake script with my colleague and friend Nul Ferreira. It was called slash slash a fake script for your fake life. The subtitle explained the use technique, just a simple and fake script in basic, Java, C and Perl. It was displayed on the wall of the Sputnik the Window Gallery in Porto and the programs Nascer Base, Viver Java, Morrer Si, Ressuscitar PL, To Be Born, To Live, To Die, To Resurrect, Basi, Java, C, Perl, allowed me to inscribe poetry in a forged code. The poems read in Portuguese, though, much more beautiful. <laughs> Sleeping springs, discomforting storms, magnetic mornings, blind shadows, electric sounds, invisible riots. Later, at the invitation of Isabel Patin, organizer of the Lethes Art exhibit in Ponta de Lima, so this is still from the Sputnik Luito, sorry. a new version of my fake scripts. Printed on transparent self-adhesive paper, the HTML code that is hidden in Twitter and Facebook sharing buttons was vaccinated with poetry. I have glued these color stickers on garden benches in the center of the city. That's me <laughs> gluing them in Ponte de Lima. My manifesto read, programmed but inoperable poetry, code stuck on the wrong medium, defamiliarizing our digital condition, transforming transparent appliances into illegible devices. A programmed but inoperable poetry is put to sleep in the public space of a city, a waiting for the uneasy discovery of the visitor. A poetic operation, programmed to be seen only, is inscribed in a digital technology of inverted materiality, a code stuck on the wrong medium, a fake script. A code thus falsified, integrating programming, language, programming languages with syntactic coherence, semantic ambiguity, but pragmatic inefficiency, a poetic programming extracted from the media sphere, printed in the echosphere. For the catalog, 
I have created a QR code that when activated directed users to a website with that same QR code. A loop, a forgery, an irony, <laughs> kinesis. In 2017, a new iteration with these pieces of code from web programming languages by invitation of Friedrich Bloch, curator of Poesis, post-digital exhibit in Kunsttempel, Kassel, Germany. In dialogue with the curator, these new fakes were printed on four cushions, <laughs> the photographs of which were later published in the post-digital publishing archive, experimental publishing informed by digital technology. Finally, in 2019, after receiving two invitations in November 2018, one from Gerardo Altaio and Eugenio Ticelli to perform in Barcelona, and the other from Erika Fulop to come to Lancaster, here I am, I made a final version of the fake scripts, this time using as metaphor, or perhaps better as metonymy, the mobile phone, a fake phone for a droid. This fake phone again is a hybrid, a mixed media object in which material and virtual try to establish a dialogue and is consisted, as I said before, of three parts which I will now try to develop. First, a hand-built object Just don't lose anything, but feel free to touch and move around as long as you can keep attention and do multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> so first, a hand-built object using the model of Samsung 9 mobile phone, it's a prototype and a random choice, with its exact dimensions, height, width, thickness, and approximate weight using 10, 10 Java functions for the Android operating system, open source, incorporating in some of the strings poetry, specifically written for these functions. The code was color printed on gray paper. The poems were printed in white, in transparent acetate. The two, code and poem, acetate and card, can be superimposed, one showing or hiding the other. To each of these functions, a dichotomy was assigned, and a booklet with 10 covers holding a page, hold a page of the map of the fake, fake, of the fake phone in case, you, in case users shuffle too much and lost, lose control of the connections. They function as well as a kind of a book which smartphones come with, with the help or instructions or whatever. Here is the relation between function, dichotomy, and poem, illustrated with images, and again, very difficult to translate Portuguese poetry to English. So I'm going to do my best, but the original poems are written in Portuguese. Cover. Brothers and sisters, the city burns, calls us, like a destiny that straightens up. Function get phone info, alienation attention. We are livid birds in quiet, reborn electric, always icy. We raise the carbon in the name of science and surround the words. We are a spring or a beach where the bird burns, where the birds burn. Function text to speech, phonia phagia. <coughs> it is in the mouth that everything dissolves, fulminant, the invention of the voice. Tell me, light burning shell. The voices, wings of the lights, break free. Function, send message, ephemeral constant. 
I await the caress of your message, rising impetuously, advancing slowly. With my head, I watch your vocalic writing. I love you so that you can delete. Function using Google Map, front, back. Maps are networks, gates, and the sea is the bed of departures where everything emerges. Earth, in the ocean that suffers in the ocean in the circles. Do you recognize these places? Rhythms in distress, a lapse of freedom on the oscillating map. Function, least contacts, private, public. How to exist in the world? Inexorable spasm of crimes, the gestures in circles. The circle of the names, the invention of magnetic fragments. Imagine, the slip in the severity of the language, the sound cultivating a garden of feathers. Function, open browser real, virtual. In the icy cogitation of the storms, we are ethereal illusions. Something goes astray and opens. Something spreads, disintegrates and shines. Function analog clock, present, absent. The moment crawls here and its meaning. There, where the night burns, the hours do not float. Vibrate, abrupt, like the gallantry of love. Function, touch, fixed, vague. Bare of the deceit of the world, everything touches with its wound. In deformed embraces, as milk entrenched in the flesh. We all touch ourselves like the roots of a tree. Function cookie cash, memory omission. You are a warm somnolence, and the city, obscured by whispers, astonished. A violent suffering awakens where I do not, do not recognize you. We are full of silences. Finally, function, take picture, considering that before the cameras were on the back, sharp, opaque. The frame, interrupted word, lightened beast, dust, the nose sweetly arched in the mist of movies, the painted gates, your bare forehand, the bodies, portraits. Second, a web application using the fake phone images that I have described was programmed, being activated by the QR code that comes in the cover. I thought this was <coughs> a protector for uh, phone, but I just discovered with Jerome that it's not, it's for glasses because he has one like this. Oh. But it, it fit perfectly, so mm -hmm. let's pretend that this was created for a phone. <laughs> okay, so this web application is responsive, meaning that it fits the dimensions of the mobile phones that access it. It is a mobile phone inside the mobile phone. I'm going to show it to you online, but you'll see the picture, which is precisely this size, and this will fit in your smartphone. This sound was performed again by Ali with a mute for synth. And from this set of recordings, I made 46 sound textures, appro approximately 20 seconds. The voice that you will hear reading the Portuguese poems is by Nuno M. Cardoso. And the code, all of the code by these functions, was read by US English Joanna. And we're talking about 240 sound files that I have created, randomly distributed. Uh, in two distinct channels. So maybe we could start here, which is a kind of an entrance that I have created for performative experiments. Goes to sleep. 
He likes sleeping with these speakers. Powering on. Yes, please. Okay, so these are the dichotomies. It serves as a kind of a cover. But the app that I was talking about, let's play it for a little bit so that you can hear, hear the beautiful text to speech voice reading uh, the code of these functions. Import android.util. Attribute set. Import android.util. Log. Import android.view. Motion event. Import android.view. View. Motion event event string builder result equals new string builder 300. Result. Append. Append event. Get action. Append. Result. Append. Super dot on pause, MTTS dot stop, at override public void on destroy, super dot on destroy, MTTS dot shut down. Linear layout XML and as Android equals. Import Android dot os dot bundle. Import Android dot provider dot contacts dot phones. Import Android dot logic dot list adapter. I'm just trying to hear the voice of the Portuguese actor reading my poetry, but it's random, so we may be here hours before he shows up. Let's give him another chance. An override public void on pause. Super down on pause. I have the files, I can play them to you. But it's really, it's really nice the mixture of the Portuguese voice reading the poems inside the code. Equals plus TS dot get device in plus backslash N SDR. Okay, <clears throat> finally in Barcelona with Gerard Altaio and Eugenio Ticelli at the typographic, Typography Automatica for a full day of work. Yes, that's me working. I have created a typographical work with four cards each detachable with short parts of the codes that you have seen. 20 signed copies, numbered and without ink, only pressure, therefore invisible, almost, and 40 not signed with very clear varnish. So, what about wrapping it all up? Lost in translation for me can be regarded as programmed poetry as performance. And the fake font for a droid may be seen as performative poetry as program. These works, they try to constitute a creative strategy that reintegrates poetry in the networked environment that we live in, translating code and coding translations. If literary works are not the sum of their technical features, then electronic literature cannot be at the service of a technocratic culture where all writing practices seem to fall under the logic of industrial management. Allow me to finish with a quotation by Eugenio Ticelli that writes, through total computability, Numbers have become the ultimate truth. An abstract, an abstract hegemony that collapses contexts and erodes human languages, imposing upon them combinatorial, connective, operational rules that render them efficient, functional, and transform them into raw data to feed economic transitions. And it is precisely upon this scenario where electronic literature takes place unless we do something about it. I did a fake phone. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Shui. Um, I think, okay, again, there are quite some synergies about, well, just to look at this quote, but also the, uh, the fake one and the thoughts that are behind it regarding poetry and language and uh, analog and, uh, uh, and digital and fake and real. Even though you didn't speak about many real, <laughs> it was, all, it was uh, more emphasis on the fake. So we can perhaps address the question of what would be the relationship between, I don't know, uh, re uh, real poetry and, uh, and, and the real phone or a fake phone and the real <coughs> No, that was a three or four. Anyway, so I got confused. But so let, let, me, let me give over the questions. Anybody any questions and thoughts that are more organized than mine, perhaps? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to yours, I can answer simply but right. just by saying, what is real? Yeah, good question. Yeah. I can't continue from there. Yeah. My poetry is real. My yeah. phone is real. The this code true, is so real. It's, it's a fake, fake phone. Exactly. <laughs> it's a loop. Um, when I was listen to you read the poems and like they're sort of like really like are you reading them in, in English but um, are you saying that they're more beautiful in uh, Portuguese well, there was something getting like lost in translation there and I was reminded of uh, Franco Berardi's um, book The Uprising where he talks about poetry itself being like the radical excess of language and that its sort of sensual quality is the thing that sort of distinguishes it from um, the, the, the world as it's sort of generally given to us, particularly today, and it's kind of like rational quality. Um, so I was, I was sort of, I suppose I wonder when I'm uh, quite often at electronic literature conferences and seeing this book, the, this work, is like, is there an ontological difference between electronic literature and its engagement with code and its critique of, you know, you were saying like it's enactment of opacity in, in that way, and just literature and poetry <coughs> itself as a radical act, you know, um, yeah. that, that has, you know, is, is there a break or is there, continuity. is it just the continuity? There is a continuity if we, you understand that, yes, poetry, Literature in general is a secondary uh, discourse, it's a discourse that defamiliarizes our connection with life. It makes the stone stony, as Shlovsky has said about art in general. So let's take that defamiliarization as a, st a starting point. Mm. But then you need to understand that with Futurism and Dadaism mostly, but also in Baroque poetry of the 17th century, you had literature trying to do that defamiliarization not only with language and the semantics of our interpretation of life, but also with media, and how media transformed, radically transformed our perception of reality. So futurism uh, addresses moving image, image collage, sound, creating noise machines, etc. So these discourses of illegibility and erasure that you find in futurism and Dadaism create a new uh, form, a new, uh, a new literature, a new poetry. And for me, only for me, I'm responsible for my acts. The electronic literature is a uh, remediation or a transposing of futurism and Dadaism and later concrete visual and sound poetry which uh, try to achieve other media, address critically appropriate other media, namely advertisement, uh, TV, broadcast, etc. So in a moment of the universal machine, starting with Alan Turing, but also with Dynabook, with Alan Kay, and more recently with World Wide Web, social networking, etc. It is my opinion that the electronic literature, based on these foundations of futurism and concrete concretism, and fluxes in general, should appropriate these network technologies in order to transform them into uh, discourses that self-reflexively uh, understand themselves. So it's a moment. It's not going to be negotiable. What you have in your Kindle or in your iPad, the PDF that you have in your computer, is not the electronic literature that I'm addressing here. That is digitized literature, literature in another medium, whatever you may call it. Um, this is slightly left field, I guess, but it's really interesting all the pictures of you making stuff all the way through. Shush. Is it, is it no, it's the thing outside. Uh, oh. 
the incursion of the real into the symbolic. <laughs> and approach the owner, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, three things. You made, you handmade the phones. Yes. Yeah. Then you went and put the things on the benches yes. with your own hands. Yes. As it were. And then there's a lovely shot of you using a proper old movable type bench. So, it was wonderful what the role of the hand in relation to this whole world of the hegemony of the capability might be in Thank terms you. of how it's Thank you for that wonderful question. It is uh, the gesture of writing uh, for a person like me, who was born in 73, and therefore Young with man. a computer yeah. in his fingers. Yeah. So I'm a digital man. <laughs> the digits, right, are yeah, yes, fingers. Yes. Um, however, I, I've always been fascinated with uh, other forms and techniques of dealing with materials and materialities of literature. Mm. Um, and what I do with code, that defamiliarization of code, is related, I, I often tell my students that um, uh, in some other cultures, before you could write or learn how to write, you had to produce your materials. The yeah. paper, the ink, the yeah. pen. And our paper, ink and pen today, or this new generation's paper, ink and pen, is WordPress. And WordPress is made of PHP. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many of them know how to program PHP. Okay. So this idea of going back to the hand, the intelligent hand, the gesture, and the touch mm -hmm. of the hand. Is it my head touching my hands or my hands touching my head? Mm -hmm. Right, Danny? <laughs> so yes, it's totally, uh, I, I was forcing myself, because I, I'm not an artist, yeah. in that sense of craftsman no, sure. artist. And you can see that it's kind of cute. Yeah. <laughs> right? But it took me months. Yeah, right. But the digital technology always uses the hand. I mean, that's what seems to get left out of it. It's still using the old keyboard. Yes. It's, it's, it gets left out of the discourse around the digital. Well, well think of the type of the think of the uh, the writing machine, the typewriter. Yeah. The typewriter was the first book. Think of Nietzsche's yeah, yeah. typewriter, right? So. Uh, or the way Hitler addresses the typewriter using. Lacan's distinction yeah. of the symbolic, the real, and the imaginary, and how precisely with the typewriter, our vision is again reattached with the fingers and not with the text, yeah. right? Yeah. The, the output of the text, whether with the calligraphy, they were blended. Yeah. So that separation that was created between the keyboard and, and the interesting thing is that the, 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 the typewriter is, <laughs> the typewriter is very, that's what I tried to articulate with my experience with the, typogra the typographical yeah. machine. Yeah. For those little cards that you see, it took me one day of work yeah. to put the types, yes. organize them. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Gerald and then Mitchell. Um, just coming up, just the, um, you get the politics of this, mm -hmm. which, I mean, there's obviously a, a well, it's very clear politics, but a yes. distinct politics. Yes. Um, and coming back to the, uh, the kind of discussion this morning around resistance and uh, how does one judge, as it were, the, the efficacy of the resistance? Is that something that interests you, or do, or do you just think, okay, this goes out into the world, if it brings about? Mm -hmm even a small transformation, then its work will have been done, or, <coughs> you know, to what extent is the success or otherwise of this project uh, located in, in the politics of <clears throat> I wouldn't say that I'm a very political engaged person, although I have my ideas about the world. My politics is essentially humanity, culture, love, yeah. Kindness. That's my easy. politics. <laughs> and if something other outside me disorganizes, <laughs> destroys <laughs> that. <laughs> ah, see? It works. <laughs> it works on Otar's phone. <laughs> so if something around my environment, around my family values, not, not traditional family values, but those elements that are my connections to the world, yeah familiar, yes, uh, is attacked, then I produce a reaction. Okay. And so most of my works are a reaction to, indirectly they also criticize uh, certain political, contemporary political positions, but you don't see me or hear me often talk about uh, 
presidents or <coughs> prime ministers right. or parties. Yeah. But indirectly, of course, I feel it, but I react in a different way, I guess. <coughs> my, most, my main concern today is algorithm politics. Yeah. The idea that datafication of our society is destroying the way we learn, the way we read, the way we write and create, the way we socialize. Um, and in that sense... Destroying or transforming? Perhaps transforming. Mm. But uh, with every transformation comes the destruction of certain aspects. And with the politics of uh, digitalization, we are not sure what it's going to be left behind. The data the bytes that are going to be erased and because it's such a huge mass quantity of data, we're just not sure what's going to. I mean, think of your, the, the images and the sounds and the videos that you have in your four gigabyte uh, drive at home. And then suddenly you have an attack and 100 megabytes of that information is lost. Do you know, are you clearly aware of what was lost? Can you care? And however, 100 megabytes of images, texts, sounds, videos was lost. Quantity demands from us a different reflexive attitude. There's a question. So I will ask a question uh, for myself. Uh, I am a, I'm a researcher, but uh, all my passion is to be an artist. But for uh, in electronic literature, you really need to know how to write codes. Uh, like my friend, Sally Chen, who is a student of uh, John. Uh, she is a really perfect uh, digital artist who can write codes. Mm -hmm. And uh, her major is digital art uh, or digital media. But my major is literature. So how to bridge lead my, uh, my major as traditional literature with electronic literature, yeah. how to make the, uh, your work more accessible, not only, not only to understand it, but also how to create, create it for yes. people who are interested. Yes. In order to create it, the key word is very simple, collaboration. Mm -hmm. yeah. Artist, engineer, mm -hmm. it's something that comes from the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> Art and technology. So please do engage and die in dialogues with programmers, engineers, teach, show them your ideas, let them feedback their own ideas, and that's the only solution. They have tried with Sally, and I told her about my wonderful ideas. <laughs> but I, I suppose that she, I feel that she is in a leading position, that whether she likes it or not. Um, so that's all. Change partner. <laughs> Insist. Money. You need to be patient. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so uh, it's for a large amount uh, quantity of people that who really want to uh, engage with this. Okay, let me go back life. to the other one then. Yeah. Today, if that collaboration can be, and it, it will not look like it's the same person that was doing that uh, keynote, but a lot of code is freely available mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. and you can have as a good partner the web. Yeah. I'm not saying uh, adopting blindly things that are templates. No, JavaScript, for instance, is a second language that everyone, programming language that everyone should know. It's easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take your time, go to Code Academy or whatever, <laughs> in, uh, sign up freely, and once a week, two hours a week, whatever, in your own pace, learn the basics, start dealing. Friedrich, uh, uh, no, actually, no. What's his name? Uh, Cory Doctorow there has a book that says, whose title is Program or Be Programmed. <laughs> you, you need to learn how to program. And it's, I'm not talking about very complex and dense programming. Eventually it will come, or not. But the basics, if you know them, you can as extract, combine, copy paste uh, uh, aspects from the web. They are fully available on the, on the web and easily create wonderful things. It's the beginning. And everything starts somewhere. But there was some, did I miss something in your, because there was one first question. You have, the other one was about collab, how to create, or how to teach, how to show, you know, these works to my partners in literature. To bridge traditional and uh, very digital ones. Uh, because 
in my field that um, my supervisor he doesn't know in yeah. electronic literature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. So I had to teach him. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Start with the collections, for instance, electronic literature collections from the yeah. LO, the OMSIP mm -hmm. collection. Uh, there's other collections of electronic literature. Mm -hmm. They have keywords, simple, basic concepts, texts. So make it, don't patronize anyone like, oh, you don't know what these electronic literature, what a, no. I mean, there's a lot of things that you don't know. I think I said, consider how to um, influence more Chinese people who, uh, to create, to, to join the collections, because I only see mm -hmm. Sally's mm -hmm. work yes. in the third yes. collection. Um, yes. And um, it's difficult how to reach out to communities that are somehow naturally separated. I once, in 2005, mm -hmm. went with Gerard Altayo, who has a Chinese son, and he works in Shanghai, the guy with the typography. typography. Mm -hmm. uh, his name is X, the son. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and Johan Uticelli, we went to Beijing. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of my po uh, digital poems is translated to Mandarin, with sound, image, and text. It's a beautiful example of how translation is modular. And we have a wonderful two couple of weeks there and uh, we did we did some workshops with locals we were not teaching them we were learning from them and they were dialoguing with us mm -hmm. I'm very cautious about this idea because I come from Portugal it's a mm -hmm. country famous for colonialism no. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore <laughs> now it's the opposite mm -hmm. uh, but still